Hello, everyone. Welcome to the WPTE 2021. Uh, that is the first edition of the international workshop of the technique for the program transformation and variation. Kanakano from Tohoku University, who chairs this workshop with uh, Adrian Risco. Um, uh, the aim of the workshop is to share the researches uh, on the program transformations and verification based on the writing techniques. The program of this workshop is found the Crowder and, and home pages. And in the home page, you can also find the abstract and the paper, if any, each, if, if any, for each talk. So please check our home page if you need. So since we have no time, let's start with the first session. So the first uh, session by Helmut Zaido from Technical University of Munich. Uh, he will give a talk about the three transducers for verification, which is a novel approach to the program verification, in particular decision procedure for the program equivalence. Uh, please, uh, let's, uh, so welcome to uh, welcome, Helmut. So thank you very much for the introduction. And so, um, so this is about tree transducers and verification. And in fact, so it's not by, so perhaps it's a little bit accidental that I will give this uh, talk. But there's one uh, point in it. I have worked on tree transducers for some time and on. Uh, program analysis and verification also these were kind of two hobby horses and it turned out to be uh, a little bit of a surprise that somehow they uh, attack the same beast at least in a certain uh, sense so let me uh, try to uh, explain that to you in the next uh, in the next three quarters of an hour about okay so so one uh, one of these uh, things which are uh, have been looked at quite intensively for uh, tree transducers is the question of uh, how to prove whether two tree transducers are equivalent, and uh, in so there are many tree transducers around. So here is a little uh, kind of picture of a hierarchy of a few of these uh, beasts. So. At the bottom, you find this DTT. So what is TT? TT means uh, top-down tree transducer, and D means deterministic. So it's top. What is a top-down tree transducer? Just it's a recursive procedure which uh, uh, descends, uh, which recursively processes uh, the uh, input in a, it is a tree input in a structured fashion and produces output for it. And uh, at the top, uh, you find this DMTT. So M means macro. So this is a, a top-down tree transducer, which additionally uh, makes use of accumulating parameters. So certain output trees can be accumulated in parameters, and these the contents of these accumulating parameters can be quite generally be computed. So this is that. And in between, there are other subclasses of uh, macro tree transducers, which uh, differ in the, uh, what you can do with the parameters. Yeah, and now uh, these are thinking of these uh, such devices to process uh, a tree input. Then the natural thing is that they also produce a tree output. But you might also consider other uh, outputs to be produced uh, in the same way. So, for example, you could consider a string output. So this is a, so you have tree uh, transducers which take trees and produce strings, and that's not so uncommon in practice because yeah so that you kind of uh, in the end uh, you produce an xml document but in in this is vaguely uh, tree structured but uh, the syntax is quite uh, so it's a, in the end it's a sequence of characters which you put into a file so in that sense so this is not so unusual uh, but it makes uh, doing uh, output in such an unstructured way makes uh, to to use a much more powerful in some sense but you, uh, when you and when you kind of restrict the output uh, alphabet to be consisting of a to consist of a single element only, then you can consider it also instead of uh, strings as a number and uh, addition as concatenation. Uh, or you could now once you uh, sorry once you uh, once you have. Uh, 
acquainted yourself with the possibility of uh, producing output in numbers, you might also ask yourself, okay, so if I have addition, why shouldn't I also have multiplication? And then you would have a polynomial, what we call polynomial tree transducers, which take uh, three input and produce, uh, a po yeah, and do polynomial computation and in the end produce a number for each input tree. Now, what is known about uh, equivalence there for these different, uh, there's always kind of the same tree transducer mechanism, but different kinds of outputs. So, best studied perhaps is the situation when the output is just trees and then there are old uh, papers from the 80s which say that equivalence is decidable for these deterministic devices and we ourselves also have looked at it so with uh, uh, Joost, Engelfried and Sebastian, uh, Sebastian Manet and we found perhaps a little bit nicer formulations of these old algorithms so this is well understood but when you go to more powerful classes and suddenly nothing is known or very little is known. So that for some subclasses of uh, basic uh, treat, uh, Marco tree transducers, that is the next, the next level in this hierarchy, a little bit is known, uh, but not very much. And now with the question, when you do consider outputs in uh, strings, so unstructured output, then in the higher uh, levels here, there's nothing is known. Uh, not surprisingly, but uh, still, and that is a, a rather not so old result, uh, that uh, for when you just have plain top-down determinist, uh, deterministic top-down tree transducers with a uh, string output, then uh, still equivalence is decidable, but that is a rather complicated algorithm. And in fact, the same techniques which we found for proving uh, equivalence uh, over with string output uh, then also uh, allowed us to uh, prove equivalence now for the full uh, hierarchy of uh, tree transducers if um, we have uh, integers with uh, with addition only so this is a rather i would say this is a bit of uh, surprising that here you can really do for all uh, uh, these uh, transducers and now when it, for multiplication, uh, I mean, all of us know that multiplication is, uh, makes things, makes life uh, complicated. And then we are back to the, if you have polynomial tree transducers, we are back to the lowest level where we have just uh, no parameters at all. But polynomial, can do polynomial uh, computations and then produce outputs as, say, so numbers, so let's say from, from a field like uh, the rationals. And that is all, uh, and in fact, this, these kind of polynomial uh, tree transducers were the, uh, the, the tool how to, uh, how to solve the equivalence problems for uh, tree to string transducers. So now what will, you, what will I show you in the rest of this talk? So I gave you an overview of what is known about equivalence or some, something, some parts of it, what is known there. Then I will kind of briefly more in, in more detail, greater detail, explain the formalism of top-down tree transducers, which we use here. Uh, then in the second part, I will uh, show you how, why that um, matters also when you want to prove invariance, so equivalence for tree transducers, but invariance for, for imperative programs. And then I will consider two kinds of in, uh, classes of invariance. One is what people call Herbrand invariance, and the other one is polynomial invariance. And I will show you uh, what is known there and how these relate to the corresponding uh, tree transducer equivalence problems. And by the way, so I'm talking here, uh, so whenever you have any, uh, any questions or comments, please feel free to interrupt me. I mean, this is a workshop and we, so ideally we should work together and it's not just a one way thing. Okay, so now if there are no further comments, let me go to the first part where we look at, uh, where I briefly recall for you what is uh, top-down tree transducers. So, I mean, it's a, uh, so top-down tree transducers should be, is a formalism to, uh, which you can use as is. So it's not just a technical thing which you can use for, for to encode application into, they are, can directly solve problems. And for example, to, to realize simple transformations of documents. 
And they kind of as can be viewed as certain functional programs, if you like. So you can write them down in OCaml or something and let them run immediately. And uh, so, uh, so here is an example. So you, uh, one of my favorite examples. So you have a tree structured input, um, perhaps a tree representing a, your mail uh, system, and inside you have. So it's a list of mails, and each mail has a certain structure and. Uh, Uh, there is a head and a body, and you want to 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 check whether you want to mark those uh, mails which are which contain suspicious contents with some extra uh, um, tag. Yeah, and that is a transformation of your uh, mailbox, and uh, you can realize that by something like a top-down tree transducer here, in order to you have you might it might be helpful just as a side remark to look into the body before you transform the head and that means you need some kind you might it might be useful to have some look ahead and uh, so look ahead is well studied for tree transducers it uh, is useful in practice but it would not add to the complication of uh, equivalence problems uh, And therefore, I will not mention it further on, but uh, just to may remind you that such a thing is around and it's helpful in practice. So now what is a, a more technically a top-down deterministic, uh, a deterministic top-down tuition user? So it's a, uh, you could consider it as a set of uh, rules. So you have states and uh, finite many states and they, these can, could be considered as functions in a functional language and then they they uh, you have rules and that is uh, one rule for each uh, so you should have rules for which they tell you for, for a particular state and a particular input uh, input symbol what to do and uh, so here uh, this what to do this is the right hand side this capital t and this is here in this simple case it's just an output tree and at the leaves of this output tree you might have recursive calls to other functions, so other states for subtrees. So the subtrees are the x1 to xk. These are the, the children of the root node labeled f here. Yeah. And it's determined, this is uh, devices deterministic if for every state and every input symbol you have at most one rule. And total, if for every such pair you have at least you have a, a rule, at least one rule. So you never get stuck. And uh, so here, for simplicity, we always will assume that all our transducers are deterministic and total. So there's exactly one rule for every pair of state and input symbol. Yeah, so this makes life easy. But still, uh, you would the, these kind of transducers would be able to transform anything, even if uh, inputs, which is not of interest because it's completely uh, ill-formed. And so you need some other mechanism to specify what it means for an input to be well formed. And there are so clearly not every uh, thing which you can build up with things like a male head and body and such would be uh, would result in a meaningful mailbox uh, representation. And so you need some kind of specification formalism. But you all know there are a variety of such things out there. So there are. So when it comes to XML, then there are these uh, DTDs or XML schemas. But here we will uh, simply use uh, deterministic top-down tree automata. This is this DTTA, and uh, so they have so they have also states. And so for a state and an input symbol, they say how to proceed uh, with the with the subtrees. So here. If yeah, if P, if you are in state P and you see the the, the imp input symbol male, then you should the P1 is meant to to uh, the, be the star, the root node of uh, the checker for well formedness of uh, an individual male and P. By that you uh, proceed on the spine to the next male. Yeah, so that would be the idea here. And so here, just for a more artificial example, so here is a little uh, such uh, tree automaton, and here it accepts would accept a tree like that, for example. So it says at the root you have this symbol f, and this is the only binary symbol 
loud here and then uh, the symbol the, mo the, you, the monadic symbols g and h alternate and uh, yeah, so that's the idea here and then now uh, this top down tree transducer so it has i was uh, i just gave it a single state so it makes to make life easy but this obviously need not be the case that every dtt has only a single state and what does it do for when it processes f it produces reproduces f but puts an h on top of the right uh, argument and then when apply when transforming g and h it kind of uh, yeah it rewrites a g to an h and an h to a g so that's the what that's what's going on here so then that transducer starts at the root and then it proceeds to the to uh, here in this case there are recursive calls for uh, the both the two children and above these recursive calls you have the the output f and the output symbol f and the output symbol h and then in this uh, remaining computation when uh, pr processing the rest of the input these symbols g and h would always be flipped so in the end you you come up with that okay i guess so that is in a nutshell what is going on here and i uh, perhaps you already have seen that so then you kind of see that everything is nothing unusual here so what i want to say here is that uh, but uh, altogether we, sh we should uh, we I would like to remind you that these top-down tree transducers are useful devices, even in a practical sense. And they are, th therefore, since they are practical devices, you may ask for verification of these right away. So you, because you want to use it. So what kind of questions have been asked and can be uh, decided? So one is well known. This is this type checking problem. So that is. You have a set of well-formed inputs and then you let run your tree transducer, you get some outputs, you ask yourself, is it well-formed or not? And then you need another tree automaton to specify what is well-formed for the output. And then you check that is, it boils down to asking uh, whether the all, uh, whether the output for every, whether for every well-formed input you get uh, something which is accepted by another tree automaton. Yes, these questions. And in fact, for macro tree transducers, this is decidable. So that's good news. And the other question is, that is uh, this equivalence problem where I showed you all these, uh, these hierarchies of uh, difficult, uh, of yeah, levels of difficulties for tree transducers. And so this is the question, whether two distinct transducers coincide. And this is like a program testing programs for equivalence in general for arbitrary programs this is obviously completely undecide undecidable now here we have simple devices which are in some sense finite state so one might hope that equivalence is decidable but uh, yeah it's not always the case that we uh, know how to do it and here that equivalence problem this is now the thing where i uh, the the starting point where i want to now want to explain to you how that is related to uh, invariants, uh, to checking invariants for uh, imperative programs. Yeah, so that is now uh, how the, the, I would like to point out how this program invariant checking can be reduced to uh, tree transducer equivalence checking. And the idea is very simple. The input you, uh, so, a program admits program executions and these are yeah so if there are no procedures it's just a path in the control flow graph and that you can represent by a monadic tree and then you kind of uh, so monadic tree so this you could feed into a tree transducer and the states of this tree transducer are the program variables okay and then for each program variable the tree transducer may produce output and that output which it produces, this is the value computed by the program for that variable. Yeah? And then when you ask yourself whether two, for, the, for all possible inputs, two transducer states always are the same, or that means that these two var program variables always have the same value, uh, 
Okay, so and that is not perhaps not generally the case, but at least when you reach a particular program point. So this control flow graph and the program points which you might reach by certain program executions, this is the well-formedness. So this is taken care of by the data, the tree automaton. Okay, and now you see here down there, there are and several kinds of equivalence problems. So X equals Y. So this is perhaps the most simple one, but you could also ask for other. So for example, you might ask whether a variable always has a constant value of five, for example. And that means that for all inputs, uh, well-formed inputs, you get always the same value. Or some, at least, well, uh, you get outputs, which kind of, when you interpret it as uh, over the integers, that this, uh, you then get always the same value five. Yeah, but you could, that is one thing, but instead of, this kind of equality, you might also ask, is it so that a certain uh, other more complicated invariant holds? So here in case that you comp compute with uh, with numbers and you have polynomials at hand, you might ask whether x squared times y minus z equals zero. Yeah, so a polynomial identity, whether that might hold or and then if you kind of do not interpret the operations used by your program, that, that means that then your program computes for every program variable at every program point a term. This is the, these F and Gs, and so A is the name of a constant, G is the name of operation, F is also a name of an operation. So that is what people call an Herbrand equality. So that is you do not interpret the operations executed by your program, but you want to know whether the uh, this uh, considered as a Herpon term, something holds when you reach a program point. So here, this is uh, this particular equality here relates the value at x for uh, to the values at y. And these Herpon equalities have been considered by people, and they are in particular this is a very strong form of equivalence, uh, which is uh, in particular then useful if you. Uh, if the operations, per, if you have, for example, floating point operations or bit operations where, where the semantics is extremely complicated and uh, you, your prover is perhaps not able to, to, uh, to calculate with these, but uh, at least if they, the same operations are executed to compute the value of X and uh, another variable, then you at least know that these will be the same. Okay, so to make it a little bit more concrete, here's a kind of a tiny program. So you have initially, so you have program variables uh, y, z, and t, and then there is a first program point, start point where uh, all variables are initialized, and you have a loop. So I ignore loop conditions here. And then you have in, inside the loop, you update the program variables by some arithmetic expressions, and then in the end, you have also this t a variable which gets the value squared of y. And you want to prove here that, for example, z equals t. And with a little bit of thinking, you will find out that this is indeed the case, but it's not so obvious. I, I mean, at least uh, so this is a typical exercise which you give your students when you give a verification class. And now how to do it as a, now you would turn in this program into a tree transducer. So I said uh, that the input to the tree transducer is a run of the program, so a program execution. So this consists of uh, no, of sim input symbols. So here you see return start. So start is a, a leaf symbol. So this is, uh, yeah, at the beginning. So at the beginning you get, uh, for, for example, for y and z, you get the values one. And then you have at the, the, the return, so, so just for the to I will need not read out uh, the whole thing here, but uh, you see here for the, at the, the, the value at the, after, at the program, after the return node is uh, the value at the immediately preceding node because nothing happens at the return. Yeah, when you jump out of the program, nothing happens. But then uh, perhaps l then look at that uh, thing uh, for the, perhaps here this four, the, what is it? This is the start point of here, this assignment. 
So it assigns uh, to T the values, uh, the square of the value of Y uh, at some, uh, at the preceding node. Yeah, so this is the, uh, this assignment. So, and at the same time, the Y and Z do not change their value. So therefore it, we have for this uh, four, uh, this uh, input symbol four, uh, three uh, rules, one for Y, one for Z and one for T. Only for T there's something interesting happens, namely T receives the value of Y times Y and the others don't change. Okay, I hope you get the, uh, uh, the idea of this uh, encoding. And here is what how it works. So the start point, this is the, the le single leaf symbol. And then you have the, the other, the unary symbols then are the return for the end. And then you have start points of assignments, uh, which uh, you could also yeah, have as unary symbol, as monadic symbols, input symbols. Yeah. And uh, then the control for graph provides you what kind of uh, in at monadic uh, trees are legal program executions. And so here is, for example, one such thing. So this is, you have, you start with start and then you go, you do execute this uh, assignment two, and then you will reach this assignment at program point three, and then that uh, assignment at program point four, and then you return. And uh, th then putting together, uh, and if you are interested in the value of Z at the return, then you put together by the, you can apply the rules and then you find out that it would result exactly in this expression, which is here put to the right of the red arrow. Okay. So that was, so you see here, so here the, um, the in, so this is a monadic thing. This was intra procedural, uh, programs which we encoded into uh, a, mon a, a top-down tree transducer with monadic input alphabet. So that was the point. And now the question is what happens if we go to, if we additionally allow procedures? And then things, well, life becomes slightly more interesting, but also more complicated. You have, you might distinguish between two kinds of variables, locals and globals. And then you have parameter passing into a procedure. The locals of the caller survive the call, and then you have to merge them with the result of the procedures. And you have to, to make such kind of technical uh, decisions in order to model your favorite programming language here. For simplicity, I assume all locals are passed as parameters. Yeah. And you have, you have no return values, uh, but only procedures. If you want, if you want a procedure to return a value, you might have a dedicated global, which receives that value. And then the caller may take the value of that global and compute with it. Yeah. And by that you have just having locals and globals and this kind of, you can simulate quite uh, typical calling conventions for a, a variety of programming languages yeah? so that you could do. And so, Here's a little example program. So I, uh, so you have a, we have a global T, and then there is this local, lo single local variable Y, which serves as a parameter, also. Yeah, and so there's a little bit of calculation going on here, assignments and uh, and recursive calls. Yeah, and since there are no, since everything is procedures, you need not care uh, whether they are the. Uh, yeah, so they do not occur as they occur as individual statements and not as right hand sides of assignments. And here the, the global may receive the return value, may be used as um, communicating the return value of, of a call to the caller. Yeah, so that is after the call to F, T has the return value of F if you like. And here you, so you see here that uh, how that is used uh, in that program. Okay, and now uh, so then how would the corresponding uh, tree transducer look like? Now you see that I have, uh, so again, the variables are the states of the transducer. And the first argument here is the, 
the representation of the program execution. And now what happens at the start? So at the start point of a procedure, what, where do you get the value of a variable y from? I mean, you need it to get it somewhere. And here we assume that you get it by the parameters in the, so that is the Marco tree transducer, what you need here. You need uh, parameters. And so here is the y and the t. And uh, so at the start point, you get the, you, the value of y is the corresponding parameter and for t the same. And now what, when you do, uh, what happens with the call? At the call, so there you make a distinction. So this is uh, a call is a binary. Uh, I, for that, I introduce now a binary operator. The first argument is the program execution before the call. And the, the x2, this is the program execution inside the call procedure. Yeah, so that means when, you, when y is a local, uh, and you, what happens and you execute a call. Okay. So then that is the value of X one of Y has after X one, because it's the, the locals are not affected by the call. And what is, if, if T, this is the global. So that there you have to take the, the value, which T has after the execution of the body. So after the X two, so that is here on the right hand side. And now you have to do the parameter passing. So what is the value, the, the value of the Y? inside that when you execute the body, I mean, this is the value of Y before the call and the value of T before the call. Okay. So in this sense, you use, you make a effective use of the possibilities which you have in a Marco tree transducer. In fact, this is a non self nesting Marco tree transducer because uh, in the, the argument here for the T2 it does not depend on the T2, but only on X, uh, sorry. Uh, the arguments here for the x2 only depend on x1 and not on x2. Okay, so once again, so in summing it up, so procedure calls require binary input symbols and the parameters used are, as you have guessed, pass for passing of parameters to the colleague. Okay, and then here's an example transformation. So this is uh, an execution for the of the of main and there is a call to f uh, and then the you need here in the right argument an execution of the f of the procedure f and then there's again a recursive call and so on and in this case it just for that the com the, the execute the expression computed by that for that is just zero plus plus one minus one and you see it will be zero if you evaluate it and in fact, it turns out that it will always be zero. Okay. So that was, so by that, I ho hope I have kind of uh, uh, convinced you that you can uh, represent um, the computation of these programs by means of tree transducers, where the variables of the program are the states and the, the, trans the result uh, for the input is produced by the transducer is the value of the variable. And now we want to, to, to check certain invariants. So one thing, let us check two kinds of invariants. One is this Herpant uh, equalities and the other one are polynomial equalities. So what is, uh, uh, once again, a Herpant equal equivalence. So what is it? So for now for just for, again, we are back to transducers. So that would be so that you have to use the states, the Q1 and the Q2, and you might may ask whether for all inputs, it is the case that the, the output produced by Q1 for that input is the same as uh, the output produced by Q2 for that input. If you then group around this expression here uh, to the right. Yeah, so that's, and this kind of uh, equivalence, you might, uh, yeah, you want to, uh, you ask yourself whether this holds uh, whenever uh, for every uh, input tree, which is accepted by the, by this domain automaton, by this data uh, in state P. Yeah, so that, and uh, in the application again, this state P here corresponds to the uh, program point and these uh, transducer states Q1, Q2, they correspond to program variables. Yeah, and now we want to know for every such uh, program point, 
the set of all valid Her Herbrand equivalences. And now you might be depressed because there are so many equivalences. You could have arbitrarily large right hand sides. There could be many. But on the other hand, if you insist on left hand sides to be just plain uh, transducer states, then it turns out that there are not so many. Because uh, if you have a conjunction of such equalities and you have two conjunctions with the same left hand side, then this means that the right hand sides must unify somehow. And that uh, otherwise you get a, a contradiction. So in that sense, uh, there can be only one such equality with this with a particular uh, left hand side and uh, yeah and this gives if n is the number of states then you get only n equivalences which you might want to compute and the question is can we compute that and the answer is yes so there is a classical method how so this is now i don't know whether that's the the standard way how uh, tree transducer uh, the tree transducer community would uh, attack it, but that is the way how a, a pro program prover would attack it. I mean, you do, you apply a fixed point computation, where you uh, now what would that do? You compute, you try to compute uh, the set of equivalences which hold, and then you for, you start with the set of equivalences which which hold if you have input trees of depths. Uh, depth zero, then depth one, and depth as you get more and more input trees, and that means less and less uh, equivalences will hold. That is, from a given set of equivalences, you, you will have to remove more and more. So by that, so if you, yeah, and you then one might hope that this uh, removal uh, of equivalences at some point will terminate. So, and that is technically you might in, introduce for every broken point P, such a conjunction uh, a calligraphic H index uh, a superscript H. And this means the all equivalences which hold for input trees uh, up to uh, with depths less than H. And then clearly the number of inputs of depths less than H is finite. So you could compute all of them. You could try to compute all the equalities which hold. So it seems as if it is uh, obviously computable. And now, so here is perhaps the, but it clearly, instead of enumerating all input trees, you there are cl more clever ways of doing it, but altogether uh, you should, uh, but at least it is ob it seems obvious that for every edge, this uh, conjunction is uh, computable. And so in particular, this edge uh, superscript uh, zero, that this is, ob with, that's the starting point. And then is when kind of all conjunctions are, uh, yeah, you have a conjunction over all equalities and this is, the, you, will, you can, this is logically false. And then now the, in the next iteration, you look at, uh, at uh, trees of depth zero, that is just leaves. And if you have a, your turns, so if in the domain for the state P, you have just uh, accept the leaf A, and you have two transducer states Q1 and Q2 with two right hand sides for this leaf uh, A, then obviously the uh, con the conjunctions which hold then is that Q1 equals the right hand side for Q1 and Q2 equals the right hand side for Q2 if A is the only leaf symbol. If you have several ones, you kind of have uh, to uh, to to find out which uh, uh, equalities hold for uh, which are true uh, for all these symbols so these might be less okay and then now if you go uh, then assume that there is a one unary symbol and you want to get the the next uh, conjunction uh, uh, h uh, superscript one then uh, you look at the right hand sides for that uh, next symbol G and you, you get the right hand sides and you see, you, you check what, which of the equalities uh, remain true. And now you see here, uh, these two equalities do not hold themselves. In particular, this Q2 is not, uh, there. you will not have the, uh, the H, the output will not be H uh, applied to B. But you see here also that there is an implied equality, namely this H uh, applied to B occurs here as a subtree. 
So that is Q1 equals F applied to Q2 and C. That is also an equality which is implied here by this conjunction. And this is also true here. So that is, uh, this, this remains true. That is, you have now a kind of a less, uh, uh, less, a weaker equality. Uh, a more liberal one, but th but that covers, uh, which is still true, yeah. And but in this way, so that is you get more and more uh, more liberal, more uh, how to say a weaker uh, co a conjunction of weaker e equalities and re weakening means you throw away some uh, equalities or you replace some definite terms by uh, by some. Uh, uh, variables like this q1 q2 here yeah and in this we, what one what we observe here is that each of these for every uh, little uh, h here you get something which is uh, a finite conjunction you get a we something which is uh, weaker and weaker uh, which is implied by the uh, by the Uh, you get such a, a sequence of implications here for the conjunctions, and this uh, implic this uh, sequence will eventually stabilize, and then you have uh, all the uh, you get those equalities which hold for all input trees. Yeah, and that means all these serpent equalities for uh, can be computed, and this is the case in particular in the case when the input alphabet is monadic. And that means, and these were exactly those which we need for programs without procedure calls. And that means all Herbrand invariants there can be computed. And if we now, the, you immediately ask what happens if we want to have procedures as well. And then comes the depressing fact that we don't know. Because you need, now you need uh, to uh, to talk about equivalence for uh, for more complicated macro treatment users, which make non That is those which make non-trivial use of their parameters. And there is only a partial results, namely uh, when the output alphabet is monadic. And we have also worked on that a little bit. And then one can uh, still do something. And one could translate that also back to certain forms of uh, uh, treatments users if one likes. Uh, yeah, it gives uh, in certain restricted cases here also an equivalence result. And uh, yeah. Okay, so now let me let us go to polynomial invariance. What is known there? So here is uh, so like a Herbrand equality. It's again, uh, if you have just a, a transducer with uh, these polyn polynomial transducer, then you for every state and every input you produce a number, and then you may ask, is there a polynomial equality valid uh, between Uh, these numbers produced for uh, different states for the same input. Yeah, and the bitter fact here is, it is uh, even if the uh, the input alphabet is uh, monadic, that is when you come when you uh, model um, a progr in programs without procedures, then it is undecidable to find out whether any program equivalence holds. But when you have a fixed program, uh, a fixed polynomial equivalence, then you can at least check whether it holds in the monadic case. Yeah, and in fact, you can do that also in case that uh, it is uh, you have a non-monadic uh, input alphabet. That is when you have a polynomial tr transducer. Yeah, and the method, uh, how I will kind of briefly sketch the situation for the monadic alphabet. So this is based on a on a WP, weak speed condition calculus and polynomial algebra. That is, if you uh, want to know whether a particular, uh, whether a, a particular uh, polynomial identity, say this calligraphic F here holds after uh, at some point and you uh, have uh, after the the uh, and then this uh, you have an input symbol h then the equality uh, uh, the 
equivalence F translates into a weakest precondition on the argument of H. And how is it so for if you for each uh, um, state of the transducer you have a right hand side and this is uh, for the for the argument of H and you see here the polynomials here to the right so this one and that one and now the weakest precondition of the post condition F with respect to the input symbol H then is you substitute the right hand sides for the uh, left hand sides yeah for the Q's in the formula. So this is this substitution which you have to do. Then you get another polynomial, and that is that's the property which has to hold for x in order for f to hold for h applied to x. Okay, and this is an old idea to use this kind of weakest precondition calculation. It we have seen that by in a paper by uh, Letyshevsky and Lvov. I hope it's like that uh, from the 90s. In, a, in an obscure algebraic uh, journal, uh, so we reinvented the wheel. Sorry for that. Uh, almost ten years later, uh, and that was you do this weakest precondition calculation. That is for every broken point, you get uh, more and more preconditions to uh, which have to hold and accumulating polynomial such preconditions uh, can then. Uh, results in a fixed point iteration and these uh, the these if you use a polynomials ID polynomial ideals to represent these preconditions then you can apply uh, Hilbert spaces theorem to conclude that this fixed point iteration really terminates and uh, then if you have all these uh, um, these ideals then you look at uh, whenever you have a, a broken point so here now Again, in the transducer setting, you have such a state P and you have a leaf symbol A, which is accepted uh, at that state P. And then, then you look at the rules of the transducer for this leaf symbol. This should be the numbers. And then you have in the weakest precondition for P, this the, the, you have kind of a polynomial, this F prime. And then you evaluate this F prime for these uh, arg concrete arguments. And this should then give us zero yeah and if this holds for all these uh, for all the, uh, the the polynomials in the ideal at p for every such p then uh, the inver the polynomial equality holds yeah from that you ca could we conclude that these polynomial properties with monadic for uh, polynomial uh, tree transducers with monadic input uh, alphabet are decidable and in fact recently it has even been the precise complexity has been uh, determined namely it's Ackermann complete so it's not particularly uh, easy but it's at least one has a precise characterization complexity wise and uh, that means in particular that also that means so this this was the tree transducer formulation but also for in the corresponding intra procedural and uh, verification problem of polynomial invariant then you find that if you have no procedures then indeed it's also decidable and ackermann complete yeah i mean there is a little bit of a generalization uh, to from the monadic input alphabet to non monadic alphabets which we which we have looked at and it, this is a great thing uh, and uh, you one finds that this is decidable but it does not yet this is still not strong enough to uh, to prove polynomial equalities uh, to verify polynomial equalities interprocedurally because for that we additionally would need uh, parameters which we do not know how to deal with there's only one thing what one can do, and I have kind of sketched it here in the remain in a few more uh, slides, namely in the case when you do not have multiplication, but everything that the the computation of the is linear. So you are only interested in linear invariance and linear uh, computation. So let me let me go back here to this. Uh, ingenious example where is my ingenious ah it was in the in here this ingenious example you see here there's no multiplication just addition and in that case 
we are back in that situation uh, what i showed you here in the beginning where we are here in the plus situation and then uh, in for plus we can do uh, also parameters in full generality and therefore it turns out that uh, in this case also interprocedurally uh, in very linear invariants can be verified i have uh, i think it is now i have talked for about 50 minutes i guess it's uh, this was long enough I therefore sketch uh, skip over the the exact uh, um, the exact explanation how one technically and practically does computes these fi and equivalences and in instead just come to the conclusion uh, which says that i mean verifying uh so that is kind of the take-home message i would say that if you have equality based in very program invariants uh, so equality between program variables so that is what you are after and that this can be reduced to deciding equivalence of certain macro treatments you said and on the in the so that's one thing and that means but the if you have a class of macro treatments users and there, there are some the more specific ones than those which i have uh, explained to you here uh, where equivalence is this is known to be decidable then this immediately translates back to uh, into a verification procedure for these equality based invariants of programs or programs with procedures and uh, what was helpful here or what, what kind of uh, now, typically, programs do not compute just with uninterpreted terms, but they, yeah, they have numerical domains, but they may also compute. You might also think of other um, other algebraic domains in which computation is done by your program. And then, one it might be interesting to look at the uh, tree transducers which produce outputs in these algebraic domains. And some I have identified, sketched, uh, which have already been tackled, but there could be other ones. And yeah, and it would be interesting to see uh, what kind of, whether one finds there new interesting equivalence problems. And in, by interesting, I mean those which are potentially decidable, that is give, uh, give rise to new verification procedures. So thank you very much. Are there questions? Oh, thank you, Helm. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, uh, how can you find that? Yes, uh, a question from Siobaka. Uh, so, oh, can, can you see the question? Uh, where do I see the question? Uh, here, uh, so that any tools using tree transducer for program verification tasks? No. Any tools? No. Not that I know. Not that I know. I mean, yeah. there are, uh, there are, uh, we have implementations of that thing with the polynomial e equality so that we have implemented. I think we do not even have, uh, and we have also tried to do some uh, interprocedural. Uh, so the, the linear things, these are implemented and uh, polynomial interprocedural equalities, they are partially implemented. And uh, there was a, a PhD thesis for that. Um, one, uh, one might, uh, ah, there's another point which I have not mentioned on the slides, but uh, in the program verification, in the world of program verification, there are also people are, since everything in principle there is undecidable, so people have come up with heuristics, SMT solving and things, techniques like that, to get at least uh, to prove, come up with proofs at least in some cases. And one might want now to kind of take these and give up uh, the idea of proving, uh, having an algorithm for proving uh, equivalence of, say, Marco Tietens users, but having uh, just such 
partial things, which at least in some cases allows to prove it. And that could also be interesting because practically, as I tried to point out in the beginning, Marco Tito scissors are not completely theoretical uh, devices, but they are quite a realistic class of functional uh, programs and um, would in this way get this, at least in some cases, uh, proofs of equivalence. Okay. Actually, some of my students uh, try to the implement uh, equivalence algorithm, a UR equivalence algorithm for the polynomial. And then, uh, ah. yeah, yeah. And it runs uh, for the two procedures, which decides uh, an, uh, non equivalence and another e run the equivalence. So, yeah. Is, it, <laughs> is, is there any, uh, did, did it terminate in more than two line programs? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, it's real. Time is so, so quick, so it, it works only for the small examples, yes. actually. Yes. Okay. Are, are there any other question or comments? You can raise hand. Some 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 of you can raise hand, but I cannot see that. So should I go to this? chat thing to the topmost uh, item to the right to see the the questions uh, yeah third third one i think all your chat ah yeah okay our yes. uh, chat for this page you can see that this yes picture. and there's a there's one more thing which i might uh, so it's not on the slides but it's an interesting thing that this uh uh, people have looked at uh, strong equivalences so in that sense they 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 took the the they asked themselves whether the two pro, they have a program with procedures and then they they try to match the procedures and then they try to prove that these procedures are equivalent and uh, they do so in that sense just have uh, so it reminds me a little bit to what people have looked at in the formal language uh, world like this origin equivalence and it's something like that, so that they, uh, yeah, so that the structure is, uh, the, the calling structure is fixed, and you assume that that kind of is the same, and the internal behavior could locally deviate a little bit, so that is, yeah, the, the if structure or the is a little bit different, and then if you use some kind of SMT solving or something to check whether uh, some non the non-loop parts, so to speak, the straight line program blocks mm -hmm. are equivalent and the, the looping and uh, recursive structure of the program should be the same. So, and in the, this, I think this similar idea is uh, close to what people have looked at with this origin equivalence for transducers. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay, any other question? So I have a question on the the extension of the, your algorithm. So uh, is it possible to extend your algorithm only support uh, regulatory language as a domain of the right? So regular regular regulatory language for domain. So yes. so so is there any possible uh, or some extension to the? For example, the regular to Iran is with uh, some equivalence, the equality, I mean, I should say. Ah. That's interesting. So that could be that, that puts extra. Mm -hmm. So for the verification, then you know, you process yeah. with Q1 and Q2, but or you, you process two different. Uh, Subtrees, but in essence, they are the same. Yeah. But if this were the case, then you could, couldn't you then simply do these uh, equivalences to put these into the transducer? That instead of calling states Q1 and Q2 for X1 and X2, you could mm -hmm. both call them for X1. Uh, I see. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I would not say that yeah. this yeah. accounts for all kinds. I think this does not yeah. account for all kinds of things. But if you have equalities between 
siblings. Maybe this can be done if you have uh, qualities between non-siblings. So then it's more complicated because then you can't do it so easily, uh -huh. I guess. That's right. uh -huh. Hmm. Okay. So, okay. Any question from? Okay. No more okay. questions. No more question. Then. So, so can can you uh discuss? Uh, do you have a time to discuss uh more? Things in the I, I, I must library. say that I have to uh, I have an appointment with my to get uh -huh. a back to get my second vaccination. <laughs> <laughs> so for for five Important. minutes or so we can do it, but otherwise wow. I would. Be, but other we we might if uh, somebody is interested or you are interested in that we might have a, a video chat perhaps uh, either later today if you don't mind. Is that possible, yeah. or uh, yeah, possible. just send yeah. me yeah. Uh, send me a, a, a link and uh, make a suggestion for a time, and we may we may talk about it. So I'm sorry okay. that I'm so. Uh, That's fine. <laughs> 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 no, nothing here. That is not on non mandatory. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I I would be happy if you have uh, for further if you would like to do have further discussion. I would be happy. Just send me. Uh, oh, just that's uh, fine. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Okay. Okay. So, so let's thanks to Helmut again. That's... Thank you. Okay. So the next session will start uh, thirty minutes later. So, please. Ah, so you have some time now. Yeah. Okay. So, bye. Yeah, see.